Charles from GMAT Ninja here. Today, we're going to talk about one of the single biggest sources of anguish among GMAT test takers, and that's huge drop-offs from your practice tests to your actual GMAT. Now, this is something we see every single day, both on GMAT Club and from students who are interested in private tutoring with us. For example, we once had a guy who showed up, said his practice test scores were around 720, goes in and takes his actual exam, and he got a 630. And I'm going to have a lot more to say about that guy towards the end of the video. More dramatically, we had a fellow once inquiring for tutoring, started at a 660 on his practice test, walks into the exam, gets a 420. And you might think, well, maybe these are just weak students who didn't know what they were doing. We once had a guy, 770 on a practice test, goes into the actual exam and gets a 650. Now, you may not be experiencing such huge drop-offs. Maybe it's only 30 points or 50 points or 60 points, but that still hurts. And today, we're going to talk about the five biggest reasons why you're experiencing these drop-offs from your practice tests to your actual GMAT exam. Reason number one is that you might be misusing the MBA.com official practice tests. Now, that could involve a ton of different behaviors. Some of the most common things we see is we often see students who repeat the test, take them over and over again, or at the very, very least, they've seen some of the questions before, maybe on GMAT Club or maybe from a tutor or course that they were working with. So when that's the case, you might say, well, I didn't remember very many questions consciously, but trust me, your score is getting inflated. And most importantly, when you see repeated questions or when you've repeated one of those official tests, you're gonna be much, much faster. Even if you only recognize the, the questions subconsciously or semi-consciously, it completely changes the testing experience because any question you've seen before, you're gonna be able to read it, think through it much, much faster than you did the first time. So there's no rule of thumb that allows us to say that if you repeat a practice test, you're gonna gain 30 points or 60 points, but just be aware that the whole experience is different and your score is gonna be inflated. One of the worst behaviors we see, and we see it with disturbing frequency, is pausing practice exams. That's one of the worst things you can possibly do. It becomes a completely different experience if you do that. Obviously, you can't do that on your test day. So please, please, whatever you do with those official practice tests, make sure you take them under test-like conditions every single time with no pausing. And if you need to repeat those exams, that's okay. Just be aware that the actual exam is going to feel quite a bit different. Reason number two is that you might be taking far too many non-official practice tests. One of the really important things to understand about the GMAT is that the GMAT spends several thousand dollars developing, editing, testing, and perfecting every single test question. And even the very, very best test prep companies can't possibly compete with that. So we often see students whose non-official practice test scores are 100 points or even 150 points different from their actual GMAT scores. In particular, if you've been relying heavily on one particular type of non-official practice test, for example, if you've been doing the GMAT club tests, you'll get used to the style of writing of those tests and you're gonna get better and better at that style. And then when you go to take an actual exam, you're gonna find the style very, very jarring and the content might be different and you might experience a really severe drop off. So I'm not saying that it's necessarily a bad idea to take non-official practice tests. They can be really, really good practice for you. But the bottom line is when you take non-official practice tests, make sure that you're taking those scores with a huge, huge grain of salt and that you're also doing official practice tests to make sure that you have another piece of data to help give you a sanity check on where your scores really are. All right, you're not gonna love reason number three. Reason number three is that test prep companies often very closely copy the questions found in the ABA.com tests. Years ago, I know a fantastic test prep tutor who made these great quant practice materials for the GMAT. And what he did is he took the official MBA.com practice test, then called GMAT prep, found all the quant questions in there and made three copies of each of those questions, just changed the numbers and language around just a little bit. And then had a student's practice doing three versions of every single question in those two MBA.com tests. Now, the inevitable result of that is that when you get to the actual exam, it might be the same topics, might be the same ideas, but they're gonna be constructed very, very differently. And if you've practiced questions that are almost exactly like those MBA.com questions, you're gonna overperform on the MBA.com tests. And when you get to the actual exam, even when the questions are on the same topic, they're gonna to feel strange to you. Now, that's a really extreme case of this practice, but test prep companies still do it. Where do we draw our inspiration from as tutors and, and test prep developers? We draw a lot of our inspiration from the official materials. So there's not a whole lot you can do about this. Just be aware that when you get to your actual exam, if you've done a ton of practice, it might be the case that you find those questions a little bit weird and a little bit different. Just be aware that that feeling might be coming when you take your actual exam. Reason number four is GMAT test anxiety. After 20 plus years of tutoring, I'm convinced that the single biggest killer of GMAT score dreams is test anxiety. According to peer-reviewed research, about 40% of American adults suffer from test anxiety. Anecdotally, just looking around at people on GMAT Club and the students that we meet, I think it's closer to 70% among GMAT test takers.
Now, there's really obvious symptoms of test anxiety for some people. You might walk into the exam and you feel your heart racing and your palms are sweaty. Maybe you're even shaking. You feel butterflies in your stomach. If that's happening, you're probably very aware that you have anxiety. But what's actually more common is that you don't necessarily feel consciously anxious, but your brain starts to have a fog and you have a hard time reading and you get a little bit paralyzed. And that reading comp passage that normally you wouldn't struggle on, you're reading it over and over and over and the information is just not going in. So if you're not sure if you have test anxiety, come visit us at gmatnisha.com. We have a, a little quiz on our website that'll help you understand some of the components of test anxiety and some of the different things you can do to fix it. Meditation, exercise, sleep. There are certain kinds of coaches that specialize in helping you with test anxiety. Sports psychology techniques often help quite a bit. More importantly, what I want you to do right now is that if you're seeing a big drop off between your practice test scores and your actual test scores, and you feel like you're just not reading as sharply and you're not sure why you're seeing this drop off and none of the previous reasons seem to resonate, I want you to be really honest with yourself and ask yourself the question, is it possible that you're suffering from test anxiety? If you're, if you're honest with yourself about it, there are plenty of things you can do to help it. But step number one, just make sure that you become aware that it's a problem for you. Reason number five, this might be the biggest one, is that you're fundamentally inconsistent in your approach to the GMAT. So at the beginning of the video, I mentioned somebody who's, who had a 720 on this practice test, went to the actual exam, got a 630. Now there's a lot more to the story than that, it turns out. So in order, his six MBA.com practice tests were a 620, a 720, a 550, a 660, a 590, and a 600. So he goes to his actual exam and gets a 630. Now I have no doubt that the talent level, and as it turns out, this is a very talented person, certainly capable of a 720 in terms of his skill level, but what those numbers tell us is that he's fundamentally inconsistent, approaching questions in different ways on different days, making tons of careless errors, mismanaging his time. So it's not about aptitude, it's not about knowledge, it's not about geometry formulas or grammar rules, it's about developing a systematic, consistent approach to the exam. So that's one of the biggest things you can do to make sure that you don't see a big drop off from your practice tests to your actual test is develop more consistent approaches. That's what we emphasize in every video we've produced, both on the GMAT Ninja YouTube channel and here at GMAT Club. So if you see this type of pattern in your practice tests, what I want you to do is really, really pay attention to the parts of those videos where we say, this is what's gonna help you avoid careless errors and develop a consistent, systematic process. I hope this helps a little bit, everybody. Again, I'm Charles from GMAT Ninja. Thank you for watching.